How can we do this to him? How can we be so unkind, ungrateful, self-righteous and lifted up in ourselves? But never think about him and how we should represent him on this earth. As I was praying about this message, I got to thinking about how we demonstrate our love to God. And I can honestly say that days, weeks, and months will go by, and the only one that will say, I love you, is my son. No one else does. I thought, how do we put demands upon you when if we can't say this to one another, and that's not really our intent, how can we represent your kingdom? How could we do this to him? Religious people fight among denominations for who is right and who is wrong. But who loves God? Who sincerely cares about being a representation to him? We don't deserve you. We don't deserve anything. Te veo gloria fiernes that you've ever done for us. We don't deserve you. It's not by my goodness. It's not by yours. It's because he loves us. But we can't express those three little words to people that are daily in our life. It makes me question, how do you really feel about God? You want him to answer your prayer immediately. You want an immediate blessing, immediate response. But how responsive have you been to others? Now, I came here to this country because the Lord told me to. I don't believe I have fulfilled what he's asked me to do. I could make excuse, but I just won't. You see, we're lacking in our society, but not just in the United States, but everywhere true, unrestricted love. You have too much pride to humble yourself and say, I love you. You don't care if somebody in your own house hasn't eaten as long as you do. The selfishness is appalling. So I wanna ask this to you, Lord. How could you ever bless us? How could you Ever reach a hand of mercy down to all of us who do not deserve it? How could you love us when we don't even have time for you? That you're a bypass word, you're just a, a side idea. We, we boast about how we've got the truth. The truth is, if we really love God, then we must reflect that to everyone we come in contact with and we're not doing it. I think about children today, and even in years gone by, I was blessed, I made it a point that when I had my children, I would be at home with them. If I had to babysit, do extra jobs where I could take my children, I was gonna do that, because I was not gonna let somebody else raise my baby. I'm so thankful no one else did. It wasn't easy, but all I had to do was look into the eyes of the babies that I had given birth to. And all I could say is, I love you, honey. Mama loves you. I love you with all of my heart. And my oldest son would always say, Mama, I love you is to the highest number of the world. And there is no highest numbers because they go on and on and on. And then I insert, I got a nine month stump on you. I got a nine month jump on you. I might be a little bit ahead of you, but we can't let the lack of speaking these words become our character. This is what the world is. They're harsh, they're vindictive, they're ugly, they're hateful. And we allow that because we reflect that same behavior and attitude. We're quick to judge somebody about their harshness. But how much goodness have you shown? What is really in the seed of your heart? God, we don't deserve you. We are not, we don't 
so shavrini toriba inasa hele. We're not worthy of you. Te bori vinasa. I remember how old I was when my mother first told me she loved me. I was 21 years old, driving in downtown Houston, and Mama said it this way, you know, honey, I think I might love you. What an awakening. It was shocking to hear those words because I hadn't heard them for 21 years of my life. But that didn't stop me from loving others. Stop making excuses for your stupidity, for your lack of dedication and consecration unto God. Stop making excuses. I stepped out on this patio and I was going to worship the Lord and I thought, we don't deserve you. We don't deserve your righteousness and your holiness. We have such a nonchalant, make it happen, preacher, go. And it's no, I won't. I will not let you play with God. As long as I have a voice, I will speak against it. Countries rise against countries, people against people. Dress is different than another one. We are so full of ugliness and hatred and bitterness. Why? Why must we be this way? You really don't know him? You really don't know him. Coming to this service today, I thought of a number of things. I thought of our actions and how they respect love. And somebody says, I don't have to tell you I love you because I show you every day. Wrong. That's the mentality of the world. I can imagine. I talk to my son multiple times per day. And even when I text him, I always say, honey, I love you. Sweetheart, you're my heartbeat. I love you. I don't care how old I am. I'm going to keep saying it and saying it and saying it because I do love him and I love those that I'm over, but that doesn't mean it's reciprocated. Have you ever thought about how many times you've walked by and said to someone, I love you? But, but no, you're full of hatred because you see those words are not hard to say when they're coming from your heart. No, Lord. We don't deserve you. We want to use you, manipulate you, try to control you for our own benefit, but we really don't love you. You took your spirit away from a world because they didn't love you and didn't keep your commandments. And they beg and beg and beg for you to return. But I don't see anyone on their face before you asking forgiveness, Lord. Our denominational barriers, our, our racial barriers, our, our prejudices have become so much a life that we should ignore and turn our face from. I don't care how bitter and how ugly and how mean you are. I'm not going to lower myself to be that way. Can't. You've done so much for me. My road has been rough, but never one time did you abandon me. My journey's been heavy, but never one time did you walk out on me. Sometimes I felt the things would collapse, but never one time did you walk out on me. And I can never walk out on you. People just throw in the towel and give up so easily as if they're seeking attention. But what did he ever do to you? When it came close to the end of my mother's life, I remember her asking this to me. She said, Sherry, why do you love me, baby? Why have you been so good to me? And all I could think of is that that's exactly how God has always loved me. 
And I said, Mama, I just happen to love you and I see the good in you. That was just a few weeks before my mother breathed her last breath. My oldest son would say to me all the time, Mama, Chris believed in you. To the day he breathed his last breath, he believed in you. But I wanted him so to believe in the God that I love, the God that I adore, the God I live for. That's what I wanted him to embrace, not me. I'm just a tiny little bitty reflection of your mercy, God. I'm nothing great. I'm nothing mighty and powerful, Lord. I am nothing without you. We give up so easy to sins and the desires of the flesh. <laughs> we don't care how it affects anybody, ourselves or those around us. We don't care. But yet we'll say, oh, I love God. No, you don't. You don't even know who he is. So how can you say you love him? Your flesh lights up and you give people such ugly looks and statements and, and unkindness. And, and I was reading the scripture in Proverbs and it looked here and, and I thought, you know, I called one of my grandsons lazy, stupid or idiot or something. I can't remember. And yet I opened up the Bible today and in Proverbs it says, why are you lazy? Why are you lazy? And I read it out of Proverbs chapter 6. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you. Because you set your destiny for you and for your children. When I see people on the internet who are being vicious and vindictive to their children, it just angers me. You're going to play with their food and take it back from them? What are you teaching them? Can't you be an example to a little bitty human blessing that God gave you? Can't you be an example? Must it always be you and you and, and what you want and what you get and all of this? Must it always be that way? This is verse number four. Don't put it off. Put it off. Do it now. Don't rest until you do. Save yourself like a gazelle, escaping from a hunter, like a bird fleeing from a net. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Man, this society would actually fall along suit against the Bible because it called them lazy, irresponsible. Oh, we can't be talked to like that. Maybe we need to get off of our high pride, which I'm going to read in a minute, and realize it's time for us to humble ourselves in the eyes of God. But not only just in the eyes of God, but to mankind. We cannot go about being high and mighty. So I'm looking at it again. Verse number six. six. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn their ways and become what you call. No, southern biondo. Learn their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince nor governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. We don't even attempt to do anything to a hundred percent or a thousand percent. I get so tired of people talking to me with a tonation of disrespect. Like I ask a question, you feel you need to talk down to me? I know your spirit. I've said to people who are in our group, why am I having to ask you why you're doing this? Oh, I forgot. No, you never had a desire in the first place. You want to get the blessings and the richness of God, but you don't want to pay the price. Some of you know that many of the graphics and stuff that you see is my work. It's stuff that I do. It's, I don't have a team behind me. I do it. I learned to do it. And even on the recent podcast that we're doing, I didn't like something in it. So I said, I'm going to take care of this. Someone says, well, why? I said, because I don't like it. If I don't like it, it's not getting my attention. I'm not going to use it. Don't like it. 
So I put myself to effort. I worked late last night, well, actually to early this morning, preparing the classes that I'm teaching on the podcast. And I got up this morning, finished up the last little bit on the exports, and now I need to get this thing where it works. And I've tried this and I tried that and I worked at it. I worked hours and hours and hours after it. And I told him, I said, I told myself, I've learned enough programs. I don't want to play and do another program. I'm 68 years old. I should not be doing After Effects and all these graphic designing stuff. I don't want to do it. But you see, none of you will. And so for the glory of the Lord, I will do my best. And about 30, 45 minutes ago, before starting this service, I figured it out. Like, yeah. You see, when you give up, you are a failure. But not only to yourself, but to everyone that you interact with. I'm so sick of people wanting relationship, but they don't want to pay the price to better their lives, to build a positive relationship. All they want is sex. You can't be your best. Do you think God finds pleasure in knowing that you profess to love him and now you're laying with some guy or some girl and, and having sex outside of marriage? Do you think that he's finding great a benefit with you or do you think he just walked out and shut the door? He walked out and shut the door. Doesn't bother you because you don't see the repercussion yet. You don't see the after effects yet. It's sad. We want to member, whimper and cry and complain, but we don't want to change. It says nobody stands over them, makes them work. It says, though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? I'm so sick of somebody saying, I need my rest. I tell you what, when I die and breathe my last breath is when I'm going to die. I guess it kind of goes in that order. I'm going to get a lot of rest, at least for five seconds before I stand on the other side of this glory to be in the presence of my king. But my body will have plenty of energy. I get aggravated at myself and, and frustrated because I want to be further along in my walking than I am. And although I get behind that wheelchair and I'll push it for a distance, sometimes if I've not had a lot of sleep, I, I can't push it far. But I still try to make the effort. I'm not going to just say it. I'm not going to walk anymore. Maybe my balance isn't the best. Maybe I, I'm unstable, but I'm still going to do what I can. One day... I'll walk really good again. But until then, I'm gonna keep trying. When I sat down to work that graphics program this morning, I couldn't figure it out. I got on the internet, I asked some questions on how to do it and came up with all these bunch of different answers and this internet's not really much better than the previous apartment, but at least we're getting something done. I looked and I asked a question. I watched a video. I looked, asked another question. I, I couldn't figure it out. I just couldn't figure it out. I didn't want to spend a lot of money on something that didn't feel like would work. And I don't have a lot of money. But I don't have money to pay somebody to do it either. So if it requires me getting up in early morning, and going to bed the next early morning, I'll do it until I master it. You see, the problem with this generation is you have no goal, you have no drive, you have no incentive, unless somebody's gonna pay you a big bounce of money to be a nasty, filthy influencer. You aren't even a person that amounts to anything if all you're doing is promoting lies and falsehoods and, and some kind of product that you don't even believe in. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. 
Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcely will attack you like an armed robber. What are the worthless and wicked people like? They are constant liars. Do you hear me? If you don't be true unto God, you are a liar. You want to run around talk about how many people you got baptized, how many people attend your church. You don't live the life. You certainly don't preach the word. So you're a liar. And you want them to follow you. Fortunately for you, unfortunately for the rest, you're just leading them into a devil's hell. I don't have any very, as I say, kind words to tell false teachers and preachers. You don't want to know the truth. Somebody provides for you information and you immediately reject it. You just show who your servant is. It's Satan. Satan doesn't want you to keep the commandments of God. He wants you to do all these things that you're engaged in. So therefore your pride raises up and you will not change. Men, you want to run after some little girl that's not even mature enough to Hardly brush her teeth and comb her hair. What are you doing? That's not what God wants for your life. Women, you're running after all these cutesy little guys. And remember, they're after every girl, as my granddaughter said in the last day or so, that's got a skirt or wearing them tight pants. Says you are worthless and wicked people. They're constant liars, signaling their deceit with a wink of an eye, a nudge of the foot, a wiggle of fingers. Their perverted hearts plot evil. My mama always taught me, and I'm still very much a strong believer in this, don't whisper in the presence of others people. Do you know why that is? Because that's a sign of a wicked and deceitful person. If your conversation is so private that you have to whisper in the presence of other people, then you're wicked, you're perverted, and you're twisted. Because if you're transparent, there would be no whispering when others are present in the house. That is one act of rudeness that I cannot stand. And when you deliberately speak too low, and I have to ask you, what did you just say? Why should I have to ask you what you said? If you wanted it to be heard, you would have raised up your volume, your volume and spoken. And I'm telling you this, not just in my situation, but in everyone I'm talking to today. We don't talk out because we don't want accountability. People don't realize I've had to have a very sharp mind. And although I fuss and complain to myself about learning one more computer program or one more thing that has to do with videography and production. I guess if I really wanted to give it up, I would. But I know in this generation, you need visual effects. You need to have content. You need to have something that will make you understand and listen. I looked at this game that came advertised on my iPad before I was looking at the scriptures and it's about problem solving and they have like a hole in the wall or in the ceiling or something and they give you a number of different items to select to fix that and I thought why do they do that and then I realized how stupid and how dummy down we've become we want to have the miracles the signs the wonders the excellence we want to proclaim that we were there well you go there and I'm going there your motive's not right. Your heart's not right. So it says, they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant beyond all hope of healing. Why? Because they will not do anything but stir up trouble because that's what that says before. Let me go back up here a little bit. Signaling their deceit with a wink of an eye, a nudge of the foot, a wingle of the fingers. Their perverted hearts plot evil, and they constantly stir up trouble. But they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant, beyond all hope of healing. So go ahead and play your games. I'm surprised that you feel that you're invincible. 
when you're not, and neither am I. You see, my day consists of being in his presence, of him approving of my life. But looking at verse number 16, these are six things that God hates. No seven he detests. Haughty eyes. You think you're so great, mighty and wonderful, powerful. That's what you think. You're beyond touching. You're superior to the rest. Might surprise you, but how I treat people does not depend upon their ethnic background, the country they're from, the gender. I treat them as if I'm going to introduce them to my Savior, Adonai. A lying tongue. How many times have you lied? Whew. You know, these are things that we need to be repenting of on a regular basis because some of us have become such habitual liars. It's appalling at the arrogance and the pride. And don't you dare call me out on it because I'm just going to flare back up at you. That's why I do the things that I do. I'm not ignorant and stupid to what goes on. I'm quite aware. A heart that plots evil. Feet that race to wrongdoing. These are the things that God hates. You can't wait to get out there and go partying. Look, you know what? That's the one trip you don't need to be taking. You make excuses for your alcoholism, your drinks. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just weak. Well, I can tell you many times in my life I've been weak. And I've simply said, Lord, I can't do this. I'm not any good at it. If you could just give me guidance and show me what I should do and, and I'll do it. Sometimes the answer is slow to come, but there's other times it's like click, click, click. A false witness who pours out lies. I cannot t tell you how much it infuriates me to be around somebody who is bold enough to slap your comments out but not man or woman enough to make a reflection and say, oh, I did say that. You don't want to be offensive, then why do you say it? If you have something that you need to say to someone, then simply sit down and say it. And if they're so immature and adolescent that they've got to throw a fit, well, that just shows you what spirit they really have been of. A false witness who pours out lies. A person who sows discord in a family. God gave us a beautiful gift of life, a family, children in the right order. And we toss it to the curbs. We don't want that commitment. Let me tell you something, ladies. You go and have a baby. You're in three years of lockdown. And that's what you have to live locked down and stop feeling like you can set this baby on the side and do your own thing. You're not ready for a relationship of maturity and neither is that man. If you look at how the man has treated his children, it's appalling to God. A father who cannot be interactive with his kids and tell them how he feels about them is a shame in the nostrils of God. How dare you? How dare you say that you're a dad when you can't even express those things and talk to them in love and kindness. You give more correction than you give support and love. And then when our child picks the wrong road, instead of us stepping in and trying to keep him from being destroyed, we just step back and let him be destroyed. I can think of incidents in my life where that's been the recourse of the adults in these young people's lives. And I wanna say, God holds you completely responsible. At some point in time, we might wanna find out who we really serve and serve him only. My son, obey your father's command. Someone said, my dad wasn't a spiritual man. 
my heavenly father, Hashem Adonai, is my father. And he is perfect. Absolutely sensational. Amazing. He don't shake and he don't quake. He's just got it to the right line. And don't neglect your mother's instructions. If I've told you, son, don't be with that person. Don't you go around behind my back and be with that person. If I've told you one thing, I've told you a million times, don't do it. But you go do it, which says you despise the instructions. But you sure like the financial benefit. And that's not directed in my child alone. That's directed to all young adults. And let's, let's come on, get, get some reality in this service today. I could have come in here and sang and worshiped and, and all of that and made you really acknowledge the Lord, but this is what you need is good down home, outright teaching. Keep their words always in your heart. Son, always keep my words in your heart. And mama said, don't, then don't. Don't figure out how you're going to get around it and then go through all the emotional upheaval because of what? Because you choose not to do that, which is right. Come on, young people. I've always said, God must have seen a purpose for me to live because I lived through a whole lot of things I shouldn't have come through. But I'm still here. And as long as I'm here, I'll still have a voice to tell you how to live for him. It says, tie the words around your heart. Tie them to your neck. When you ask their counsel will lead you. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. For their command is a lamp and their instruction is a light. Their corrective discipline is a way to life. Young people today say, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm grown. By your actions, I would never know it. You can't support yourself financially, so you're going to go get involved with a relationship? I don't get it. You didn't think about the fact that when you look at economy today, the average, and I say minimum wage in Texas is about seven thirty-five or somewhere in that. And you might be fortunate to make 10, so let's do a little math. So if you didn't have to pay taxes, but you do, you would not be getting or bringing home a full $4,400 a week because after you get the taxes taken out, you're going to bring home about three twenty-five. dollars After you take care of child support or daycare, you're going to drop another $176 per week. Now you've got about $120, $130 to live off you and your spouse to cover your rent, your electricity, your essentials, not including car, car insurance, or anything of emergency. And you're ready to jump into what? A relationship? Have you literally lost your mind? So at some point, the fights will come because of financial instabilities. It says, the instructions of your mother will keep you from an immoral woman. The instructions of your father, commandments of your father will keep you from immoral women. Why do you want to go date somebody who don't even have an interest in God? How do you know? If their conversation isn't about God and their character doesn't reflect God, they're not serving him. And I'm not talking about a set formula to be saved here. I'm talking about letting your character reflect what you believe, not by some banner that's over your church door. Don't lust for their beauty. Hello, young men. Don't lust for their beauty. Hey, young ladies. Don't let her coy glances seduce you for a prostitute prostitute will bring you to poverty any young woman who takes you to bed is a whore that's all there is to it any young man who takes you to bed is a whore that's all it is to it there's no commitment commitment says if you get sick and we are married i'm going to stay with you and help you and bring much happiness to you as long as we breathe this life together and when you leave I'm going to grieve the fact that I don't have the opportunity to spend with you anymore. We get into relationships and we can't even stand the person. We're so busy finding fault, we don't even have a clue what they're about. But sleeping with another man's wife will cost you your life. But sleeping with another man's wife will cost you your life. 
Can a man scoop a flame unto his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Now that's a very explicit statement. You play with fire, you will get burned. You can't set it in your lap and think it's not going to affect you. So at some point in time, as a mature individual, you say, that was a stupid choice. I need to get this act together. But don't take my word. Go ahead and end up in prison like some I know have. Don't listen to me and live with a life of regrets because you know better. Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? Can you tangle with the fire? Can you hold a match to the very end and not move it to see whether it's going to burn your fingers? Are we that stupid? And yes, I did say, are we that stupid? So click that and send a notification of, I called you stupid. Because if you're doing this, yep, I just did. So is it with the man who sleeps with another man's wife, he who embraces her will not go unpunished. Excuses might be found for a thief who steals because he's starving, but he that's caught must pay back seven times what he has stole, even if he has to sell everything in his house. God forgives. Don't think he doesn't. You have committed horrible sins in your life. And to be right with God, you need to not only be right with him, but be right with the person that you violated. It says even if he has to pay back everything seven times in his house. I have people right now who owe me a tremendous amount of money, but make no effort to take care of it. I'm over here spending $1,500 a week to be in this apartment to do what we're trying to do for God. And I don't get no financial help from anybody, no one, and no one really cares. Now tell me how scary that is. And you wanna tell me you're about the service of God? And when I bring it up to you about the finances, it's always about money. You know, you just showed how shallow you really are. Because anybody in their right mind who knows I came on this place as a mission to do a work for God will know I didn't use your money. But it would only seem right that I shouldn't have to ask you, beg you, plead you, but that you would sit down and go, you know what? I can push back from the table and I can go without some meals and see if I can't help them on what they're there to do. But nope, we can't do that. And I want to go another step further. Any man who does not find out what's going on in his own house finances is not a man. Did you hear what I said? It's your responsibility as head of your house to know what's happening with your check and where it's going. And if that woman does not give you that information, she's a thief. And for you not having an interest in it, you're worse because you taught your children how not to be accountable. We want God to move in a powerful way, or so we say. I'm gonna lay it out here and make a true confession. I think it's worthy. No one in my church, and I repeat, no one in my church has gone to their face before God and asked him to move among the people. No one. And as I've laid in my room and I prayed and sought him, I realized today how much we really don't love him. Does he deserve my least are my best. I haven't seen any tears shed for the people outside these doors. We all want to see this great mighty move of God. That is a lie. No, we don't. I see no sincere prayer. Well, I don't pray in front of you. I watch your actions and you don't even live in front of me. So let's not even play that noise. It's all about you, your desires, 
your wants, what you want to see happen. And I'm going to straight, say this straightforward to all of those who sit under my ministry. I will not make a mockery of God by allowing half-hearted, insincere individuals to stand by me anywhere. So you see, it's not pastor doesn't want. It's pastor's been watching. And what I see, I don't like. I want this world to know him more than anything in this world. I want them to know what it's like to experience his presence. Not because I want to be great, because he deserves to be the greatest. Pastor, go do your thing. Mm -mm. God is not a puppet on a string. He is not somebody you toy with and play with. He is my redeemer, my savior, my life. And I would much rather leave this life than bring him shame. stood out here and this lady was telling us to turn the music down and as I stood there I thought about this they don't need my singing they need him and to see the love of God through me to them that's what they need my prayers that's what they need a mighty demonstration of a mighty woman of God no, that just brings the, those who come for the miracles and the loaves and fishes. But I'm talking to you who are sincerely hungry to serve God. As I said here before we started the service, I thought about a song, a chorus that we used to sing many years ago. And all through my life, I've sung it periodically. And it simply says, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Take joy, my King, and watch you hear. And let it be a sweet, sweet spirit to your ear. We will never deserve your goodness. We will never deserve your righteousness. But Lord, make me the vessel that you need to use. Let me reflect what you are about. Let me uphold what you represent. I had a great grandmother that I was blessed to know for a few years of my life. And I remember at her funeral, this is what they said. They said that my great grandma Prather was a, mo a woman of great character. She never had a bad thing to say to anyone. They talked about how amazing she was. And Daryl and Barbara, if you're hearing, I know you remember that. And I'll never forget hearing that as a legacy that my great-grandma passed down to me, to Daryl, to Barbara, to Jerry, and all of those that came after her. A legacy. Maybe our parents couldn't be like she was. But the grandma I know, what a mighty woman. When I would go to the summers to spend a few days with her at the farmhouse, I would say, Grandma, can I sleep with you? Do you know why I wanted to sleep with my grandma? Because every night 
night I could hear my grandma pray. And that was something I got to hear. And I would see my grandma get down beside her bed. But before she did, she'd take her long hair down. She'd brush it, prepare to go to sleep. She'd walk over to the bedside and she would get down and start to pray. I don't know the words she said, but I know the action she did. And every part of her life to me was kind and merciful. She gave mercy when there shouldn't have been some. So I would say, Grandma, can I sleep with you tonight? Just because I could hear those golden words of prayer. And it made an impact on my life. And when I heard them say that my grandma was the most outstanding woman ever, I felt so honored to be able to say that that was my grandma. My great grandma Prather, I loved her so much. And if I could just be one tiny little bit, the love that she showed, I'd really make an imprint on life. We can't do anything but be our best. The world's managed to be the worst. Can we be our best for him? Before I close, I am gonna pray. But this is more so for me talking to him than for you to listen to me pray. <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry that we've let you down. I'm sorry that we've not been our best. That we've let our own ways influences. I'm sorry that I've done that, God. I'm sorry that sometimes I replace you with insignificant things. God, if you don't ever bring your spirit back to this world, I will not ever be angry with you because I don't deserve it. None of us do. And in all of my humanity, I will still strive to be my very best for you, God. I put myself on the back burner that I might be that that you need me to give and be today. I will do that, God. There is none more righteous and holy than you. You've gotten the bum rap on so many things that you never did. Oh God, break our spirits. Break my spirit, Lord, and let me love and worship you like we need to, like I need to. That I can be what you want me to be for all the days of my life. It's not about my glory. It's only yours. Oh, God, help my tongue and my attitude to always be reflective of you. Oh, please, God. Make me, guide me, mold me, shape me to be my very best for you. And all of those that would have criticized me, let them speak on. It doesn't matter. All that matters in this life is that my ways please you. That's all that matters. All the rest isn't important. And now, God, I... I want to thank you for every heartache and every disappointment 
every frustration, every aggravation, every unexpected twist and turn. I want to thank you for that. Because <coughs> I am who I am today. Because you never gave up on me. Never. And I know, Lord, you're not giving up on humanity either. They gave up, but you're not giving up on them. I ask you, Lord, let me be a testimony in this here city. Let me bless those that I come in contact with, with kind words and gestures of love and kindness and understanding. Why must there be war? Why must there be terror? Why must there be hatred? If it needs to start with one person, Lord, let it start with me. Let it start with me. I will spend the rest of my life thanking you for all that you've done for me. And I will never be a quitter. I can't. You see, I give up isn't in my vocabulary. Hanging on is, but not giving up. God, help me, please, to do what you want me to do in this life. In this time, in this place, help me, please. And all of those today, Lord, that are listening, please go into where they live and talk to their hearts. The young woman that I know is facing death without God. There's nothing more heart-wrenching than that. And I'm way far from where she's at. See, I remember when my brother was in a massive car accident in July. I knew in my heart he was leaving me. He was my baby brother. And I knew I had to get there because he wasn't saved. So I went from Oklahoma, drove to Dallas, got on the next plane that I could to get out of there. My older brother looked at me when I called her and said to me, we don't need you here. And I thought, no, you don't, but my little brother does because I'm the only one who can take him to God. I got there, was called to the hospital. My brother was in ICU on a machine. I stood from a distance and I prayed for him. I wanted him to be saved because he was going to leave me. I wanted to make sure his eternity was secure. So my older brother asked the nurse if I could see him. She said yes. And the first thing I did is I went over and I took my baby brother by the hand. And I said, David, I know you can hear me. But I need to make sure that you're going to make it. The nurse came over and she said, I do not know what you're doing. But whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because he's responding to you. The machines are starting to be activated. All I was doing was making sure he got it all right. As I held his hand, I said, David, I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to pray this way in your head, your heart. God, please forgive me for the things that I have done that offended you. Please forgive me. It was a tear trickled down my brother's cheek. And I knew when the minute he touched her throne. I prayed a little bit longer. And they told us we had to leave the room, so we went back to the hotel. 
We had just walked in the hotel when my older brother came and said, Tate is gone. I was so glad. The last thing that came out of his mind and his heart was knowing that God had forgiven him and that he was going to be okay. Think about it. Think about it. Everything's not in always miracles. The miracle of life is sometime in allowing those that we love to go. But making sure that when they go, that they're in the presence of the king. Step outside of yourself. When my daddy making arrangements for my brother's funeral, he said, the one thing that I regret in this life is that I brought you children into the church and I dedicated you to the Lord, but I didn't live it. And he said, now, I can't get this right. And I said, Daddy, I got it right. I made sure that David was going home to be with the Lord. And he let me know because, you see, he gave me a sign. David passed away on the 7th of July. Wow. So I told Mama, don't be angry at God. He just made sure that David wasn't going to be in any more problems. Health issues. She said, oh, I'm not. Letting somebody go is the hardest thing a person ever does. But to make them suffer through pain is more, I think, treacherous than imaginable. I see all these prayer requests going up. But maybe it's time for you, for you to start praying. For you to take your loved one by the hand and not tell both Facebook people you don't even know to pray for you. Maybe that's what you need to do. So God, we don't deserve you. Please hear our cry. I hope today you've given some thought to what I've been saying. You see, I'm going to live this life but once. And when I leave here, I know that I'll walk again very good. I won't suffer in my body, neither will you. that all of us that are left behind need to ask for the strength of God that we can live on the legacy that was lived before us. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time to watch this message on the Sabbath day as it begins to come closer and closer to the end here in Jerusalem. I want to be the blessing that people will have hope in. Nothing great, just loving God. Why don't you try that? Stop fighting your debating systems about who's religiously right and who's religiously wrong. Why don't you first find a relationship with God before you continue all that? It's not the number of people you baptize or those who speak in tongues and have the Holy Ghost or don't or get christened or whatever the ritual is that your church goes through. Your relationship with God is what counts. Let's all get a relationship with him today and be our best and do our best to serve him. Thank you. May God keep you.